This week we'll be talking about motivation and emotion from Chapter 8. What drives you to want to learn about psychology? Why did you choose the career you're in? About your partner? About where you live? Are your drives different from other people, or do we all share the same goals in life? This chapter discusses the various theories related to motivation and emotion. First, I'll talk about the different views on motivation, from those deemed instinctual, internal, and those viewed as external. And then I will discuss some of the different theories of emotion. Motivation. So what is it? It is defined as the willingness to put effort into achieving a goal, or in other words, the why we do what we do. It is what causes us to take action, whether it's to grab a snack to reduce hunger, enroll in college to earn a degree, or run like mad if you see something scary chasing you. We'll be exploring a few theories, including instinct, which is uh, in the neuroscience approach, drive reduction, which combines neuroscience and behavioral, and maybe some cognitive, arousal, which is in the behavioral realm, incentive, which includes behavioral and cognitive, the cognitive, and the humanistic. Let's start with instinct. With instincts, we are born to be motivated. As we were recently discussing in class with learning, there are certain behaviors we do not have to learn. They are involuntary and unconditioned. Instincts are those involuntary actions that we are born knowing. According to instinct theory, people are motivated to behave in certain ways because they are evolutionarily programmed to do so. For example, a mother is genetically programmed to take care of the needs of a baby, as there is an evolutionary imperative in doing so for perpetuation of the species. And babies have an inborn rooting reflex that helps them seek out a nipple and obtain nourishment. An example of this in the animal world is seasonal migration and making nests. Humans and animals alike do not learn to do this. It is instead an inborn pattern of behavior. The next is drive reduction approach, where the body actively works to maintain a certain state of balance or equilibrium. And when there's a lack of basic biological requirement, it produces a drive to obtain that requirement. Motivation arises as a result of these biological needs, where the term drive refers to the state of tension or arousal caused by biological or physiological needs. These are called primary drives. Some examples include hunger, thirst, and being warm. This drive usually creates an unpleasant state, a tension that needs to be reduced. In order to reduce the state of tension, people seek out ways to fulfill these biological needs. We get a drink when we're thirsty. We eat when we're hungry. We turn up the heat or put on a coat when we're cold. There are also secondary drives, and these are motivations where no biological need has to be fulfilled, but attention has still been created that needs to be reduced. For example, one of the secondary needs is the need for achievement, so when tension is created for an upcoming exam, the drive to decrease the tension motivates an individual to study. I'll discuss secondary drives in more detail a little later in the lecture. The arousal theory of motivation suggests that people take certain actions to either decrease or increase levels of arousal so it maintains a certain level. When arousal levels get too low, for example, a person might watch an exciting movie, go for a jog, or they may need even more stimulation and would engage in some extreme activities such as these. Can you see yourself doing any of those? When arousal levels get too high, on the other hand, a person would probably look for ways to relax, such as meditating or reading a book or hanging out at the beach, maybe going for an easy bike ride, or even fishing. According to this theory, we are motivated to maintain an optimal level of arousal, although this level can vary based on the individual or the situation. When you look at these two scenarios, depending on your arousal level at the moment, which one would you choose? Let's do a quick recap between drive reduction theory and arousal theory. In drive reduction theory, if the stimulation becomes too high, we try to find ways to reduce it. And in arousal theory, if the stimulation is too low, we try to find ways to raise it. In each approach, the intention is to try to reach a place of equilibrium. Kind of like Goldilocks, 
not too cold, not too hot, but just right. Let's look now at incentive theory. The incentive theory is one where motivation is based on the desire to get an external goal. It suggests that we are motivated to do things out of a desire for reinforcement, incentives, or rewards. There are many different reasons why we do things. Sometimes we are motivated to act because of internal desires and wishes, and I'll talk about those in a minute. And at other times, our behaviors are driven by those desires for external rewards that motivate us to take action. We may want money, fame, love, acclaim, even food, plus many others. For example, you might be motivated to go to work each day for the monetary reward of being paid, or study hard so you can get good grades, or exercise so you can have that extra piece of cake. The cognitive approach is an internal process that reflects the desire to achieve certain goals based on an individual's beliefs and expectations. It can be divided into two basic types, intrinsic motivation and extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation is the desire to do something because it is enjoyable. If we are intrinsically motivated, we would not be worried about external rewards such as praise or awards. The enjoyment we experience from the activity or action is sufficient for us to want to perform the activity or action in the future. Think about positive reinforcement here as well. Receive a reward and that will increase the likelihood of that behavior occurring again. And with intrinsic motivation, the enjoyment of engaging in activity is the reward in and of itself. Some examples include writing poetry because of the enjoyment you get out of it, reading a nonfiction book like a biography because you are curious about the topic, and playing chess because you really like strategizing. You do it because you want to, not because of some external influence or gain. Extrinsic motivation is the desire to do something because of external rewards such as awards, money, or praise. People who are extrinsically motivated may not enjoy certain activities. They may only wish to engage in certain activities because they wish to receive some external reward. Some examples of extrinsic motivation include writing poems to be submitted to a poetry contest, taking a job you don't really like but will take it anyway because it pays well, selecting a college major based on salary and prestige rather than on personal interest. Let's take the example of playing chess. The intrinsic motivation, as mentioned above, is that you really enjoy strategizing, figuring out the next moves, the planning ahead, the surprise moves from your opponent. The extrinsic motivation would be to win, and it would be even better if money, a trophy, or recognition is involved. Intrinsic is participating in an activity for its own enjoyment, and extrinsic is participating in an activity for a tangible reward. Humanistic theories of motivation are based on the idea that people also have strong cognitive reasons to perform various actions. This is famously illustrated in Abraham Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs, which presents different motivations at different levels, as can be seen in this image. First, people are motivated to fulfill basic biological needs for food and shelter, as well as those of safety, love, and esteem. Once the lower level needs have been met, the primary motivator becomes the need for self-actualization or the desire to fulfill one's individual potential. According to this theory, people are driven to achieve their maximum potential and will always do so unless obstacles are placed in their way. These obstacles can include hunger, thirst, shelter, financial problems, safety issues, or anything else that takes our focus away from maximum psychological growth. The hierarchy of needs shows that at the lower level, we must focus on basic issues such as food, sleep, and safety. Without food, without sleep, how could we possibly focus on the higher level needs such as respect, education, and recognition? The physiological needs are literally the requirements for human survival. If these requirements are not met, with the exception of clothing, shelter, and sexual activity, the human body simply cannot continue to function. When physical needs have been relatively satisfied, then safety needs take over and motivate behavior. These needs have to do with people's yearning for a world that is ordered, and in which perceived unfairness and inconsistency are under control, a world where the familiar is frequent and the unfamiliar is rare. In the world of work, these safety needs show up as wanting job security, or health with things like insurance, or retirement with savings or retirement accounts. After physiological and safety needs are met, 
The third level of human needs are social and involved feelings of belongingness. This aspect of Maslow's hierarchy involves emotionally based relationships in general, such as family, friends, and intimate relationships. People need to feel a sense of belonging and acceptance, whether it comes from a large social group, such as clubs, work, church, sports teams, gangs, or small social connections like family members, intimate partners, mentors, close colleagues, or friends. They need to feel love and to feel to be loved, sexually and non-sexually, by others. In the absence of these elements, many people become susceptible to loneliness, social anxiety, and clinical depression. The next layer is that people have a need to be respected and to have self-esteem and self-respect. Also known as the belonging need, esteem presents the normal human desire to be accepted and valued by others. People need to engage themselves to gain recognition and have an activity or activities that give the person a sense of contribution, to feel accepted and self-valued, be it in a profession or a hobby. Imbalances at this level can result in low self-esteem or an inferiority complex. People with low self-esteem need respect from others. They may seek fame or glory, which again depends on others, but low self-esteem will not improve their view of themselves simply by receiving fame, respect, and glory. They must first accept themselves internally. Throughout our lives, we work toward achieving the top of the pyramid, self-actualization, or the realization of all our potential. Self-actualization means a complete understanding of who you are, a sense of completeness, of being the best person you could possibly be. As we move up the pyramid, however, things get in the way, which slow us down and often knock us backward. Imagine working toward the respect and recognition of your colleagues and suddenly finding yourself out of work and homeless. Suddenly, you are forced backward and can no longer focus your attention on your work due to the need for finding food and shelter for you and your family. So we can see here that the hierarchy of needs is a fluid system based on what's happening in the environment. Now what about food? What is our motivation for hunger and eating? From the biological perspective, most of the feelings of hunger come from the hypothalamus. There are actually two areas in the hypothalamus that control hunger. The first is the lateral hypothalamus that causes you to feel hunger. If your lateral hypothalamus gets damaged, you would never experience hunger again from a purely physical perspective. You would probably lose a lot of weight, but I wouldn't recommend it as a diet plan. The other is the ventral medial hypothalamus, which makes you feel full. This is the mechanism that triggers the response of stopping eating. If the ventral medial hypothalamus gets damaged, you would never feel full again. Given the right amount of food, you would probably gain a lot of weight. For example, this rat has damage to its ventral medial hypothalamus, so it doesn't know when to stop eating. There is no trigger to let it know that it is full, so it keeps eating and eating and eating. And as you can see, it is quite large. If the hypothalamus is functioning normally, these two areas oppose each other and signal impulses to eat and stop eating at appropriate times. The weight set point theory states that the hypothalamus wants to maintain a certain optimum body weight so that when we drop below that weight, the hypothalamus tells us we should eat and lowers our metabolic rate, which is how quickly our body uses energy. The hypothalamus tells us to stop eating when the weight set point is reached and raises our metabolic rate to burn any excess food. Researchers used to believe that the feeling of hunger comes only from our stomach, but there are also psychological factors in hunger. Some of us eat even though our hypothalamus is not sending us any cues. If you are motivated to eat not by feelings of physical hunger, but by cues such as stress, smells, or that food is sitting right in front of you, then this would be an example of psychological factors. Think of having a bad breakup and eating a gallon of ice cream, or having a hard day at work and wanting to have macaroni and cheese or some other kind of comfort food. This is an example of conditioning in action where we associate food with comfort and consolation for psychological discomforts or suffering. Social factors are also a determinant in eating motivations. When socializing, do you tend to eat more or eat less when you're around other people? Do you eat certain foods when you're with others or when by yourself? For example, you go out to dinner with a group of friends and they all order salads and you really want a burger, but you feel compelled to eat healthy like the rest of the group, so you order a salad. Maybe on the way home, you stop for a burger and fries. Culture and background are also a factor that can affect our eating patterns and preferences as well. For example, some cultures encourage large portion sizes and others encourage moderation. Think of large Italian dinners with spaghetti and meatballs and bread and salad and dessert. 
versus a Japanese meal of fish and rice. There may even be individual social differences like those who grew up eating peanut butter and jelly omelets. Or could you imagine eating fish flavored ice cream or earthworm cookies? Let's take a quick look now at eating disorders. What can happen when the motivation for eating becomes dysfunctional? We get eating disorders. The biological explanation includes factors like imbalances or damage to the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. Psychological factors include cognitive and perceptual disorders. Two major eating disorders are anorexia nervosa and bulimia. A common thread between both disorders are issues of control. For anorexia, which has a higher occurrence in women than men, the individual has the power to decide what goes into her body. It is a disorder that is also distinguished by a distortion of one's body image. For bulimia, the individual, again mostly women, vacillates between lack of control and control. The individual feels compelled to gorge on food and then, either through guilt or chemical imbalance, a purging of the food gets triggered, either through vomiting or intense punishing exercise, which results in the unhealthy cycle of binging and purging behavior. Now let's take a look at secondary drives. There's the need for achievement, the need for affiliation, and the need for power. And I'll go through each one individually. Let's start with the need for achievement. This is the need to achieve, excel, and succeed to a certain level of excellence. A person with this type of need will set goals that are challenging but realistic. The goals have to be challenging enough so that the person can feel a sense of accomplishment. However, the goal also has to be realistic as the person believes that when a goal is unrealistic, its achievement is more likely due to chance rather than personal skill or contribution. So they choose tasks of intermediate difficulty, those tasks that are not too easy or not too hard. A person with a high need for achievement prefers to work alone or with other high achievers. They do not necessarily need praise or recognition because achievement of the task is their reward. Now let's look at the need for affiliation. This is the need for friendly relationships and human interaction. There is a need to feel liked and accepted by others. A person with a high need for affiliation is likely to be a team player and thrive in a customer service environment. They will perform best in cooperative environments as well. High affiliation individuals are sensitive to relationships with others and low affiliation individuals are those that are alone more often than not. You may know a lone wolf or actually be one yourself. The need for power. This is the need to lead others and make an impact. This need can exhibit itself in two ways. The first, which is the need for personal power, which may be viewed as undesirable as the person simply needs to feel that they have power over others, although this is not always the case. They don't have to be effective or further the objectives of their employees or others. The second type of need for power is the need for institutional power. People with the need for institutional power want to direct the efforts of their team to further the objectives of their organization. And you'll see individuals with a high need for power in positions like politicians, CEOs, and yes, even professors. Let's move on now to emotions. What is an emotion? Is it a feeling? And then what is a feeling? These terms are difficult to define and even more difficult to understand completely. People have been attempting to understand this phenomenon for thousands of years, and it will most likely be debated for a thousand more. The mainstream definition of emotion refers to a feeling state that has both physiological and cognitive elements, and that also influence behavior. So emotions involve thoughts and cognitions, physical changes, and outward expressions of behavior. But what comes first? the thought or the physiological arousal, or the thought or the behavior? Or does emotion exist in a vacuum, whether or not any of these other components are present? I'll talk more about a few of the leading psychological theories of emotions. The first theory of emotion I'll be discussing is the James Lang theory. The James Lang theory of emotion says that an event causes a physical reaction first, and then we interpret this arousal. Only after we interpret the arousal can we experience emotion. If the arousal is not noticed or is not given any thought, then we will not experience any emotion based on the event. For example, 
You are walking down a dark alley late at night. You hear footsteps behind you and you begin to tremble. Your heart beats faster and your breathing deepens. You notice these physiological changes and interpret them as your body's preparation for a fearful situation. You then experience fear. So the progression goes from event to arousal to interpretation to emotion. The next theory is the Cannon Bard theory. The Cannon Bard theory states that we experience physiological arousal and emotion from an event at the same time, but gives no attention to the role of thoughts or outward behavior. Using the same example as the previous slide, you are walking down a dark alley late at night. You hear footsteps behind you and you begin to tremble. Your heart beats faster and your breathing deepens. At the same time as these physiological changes occur, you also experience the emotion of fear. Another theory of emotion is the Schachter Singer theory. According to this theory, an event causes physiological arousal first. You must then identify a reason for this arousal, and then you are able to experience and label the emotion. So, again, let's look at the dark alley. You are walking down a dark alley late at night. You hear footsteps behind you and you begin to tremble. Your heart beats faster and your breathing deepens. Upon noticing this arousal, you realize that it comes from the fact that you are walking down a dark alley by yourself. This behavior is dangerous and therefore you feel the emotion of fear. The progression of this theory goes, there is an event, then an experience of physical reaction, then a thought comes in, then you feel the emotion. You will have an opportunity to explore this more in class and experiment for yourself what happens in your own experience without having to walk down a dark alley at night. So what actually are the functions of emotions? Well, we're seeing that emotions play an important role in how we think and behave. Again, it is important to understand what these three critical components of emotion are. Our emotions are composed of a subjective component, or how we experience the emotion. A physiological component, a physical component, which is how our bodies react to the emotion and an expressive component, which is how we behave in response to the emotion. These different elements can play a role in the function and purpose of our emotional responses. Our emotions can be short-lived, such as flash of annoyance at a family member, coworker, or friend, or long-lasting, such as enduring sadness over the loss of a relationship. So why do we experience emotions? What are its functions? What role do they serve? First of all, they prepare us for action. Let's go back to being in a dark alley hearing footsteps. If we register the feeling of fear, we are more likely to engage in an action like running, for example. Emotions can also shape our future behavior. For example, being in an intimate relationship and feelings of love and caring lead you to getting married. Another role of emotions is helping us to interact more effectively with others like getting together with other students to study for an exam. You may all be nervous about taking the exam, and so there is a commonality of emotion that helps bond people together and work together for a common goal. On the flip side, emotions can also create problems in relationship with others, so it's important in interacting with others to understand our own emotions. We also tend to take certain actions in order to experience positive emotions and minimize the probability of feeling negative emotions. For example, you might seek out social activities or hobbies that provide you with a sense of happiness, contentment, and excitement. And on the other hand, you would probably avoid situations that might potentially lead to boredom, sadness, or anxiety. Now that we have an idea of why we have emotions, how do we label our emotions? Most researchers agree that there are six basic emotions that are universally recognized. Happiness. Anger, fear, sadness, disgust, and surprise. These six basic emotions mix and combine to form a variety of feelings. For example, as a subcategory of happiness, Joy plus anticipation might combine to form optimism. We'll be exploring these some more in class with some activities and exercises.
How do we determine the range of emotions? We can see from this image that there are two categories of emotions, positive and negative. Under each category, there are subcategories, and within each subcategory, there are sub-subcategories. This is only a partial listing, and as I noted in the previous slide, there are a combination of emotions that produce other emotions. Emotions researcher Paul Ekman identified over 7,000 facial expressions, so you can see that there is a wide range of how we can experience and express what we are feeling, as they can be very apparent or very subtle. And again, we'll have time to explore this more in class. Let's review the components of emotion. Take a look at this image. We start with a stimuli in the environment that produces a response physically, mentally, and behaviorally through the cognitive appraisal, the physical response, the instrumental behaviors, and the expressive behaviors. These are the four basic components of emotions. So after a stimuli has been presented, the cognitive component, which emphasizes the importance of thoughts, beliefs, and expectations, determines the type and intensity of the emotional response. If you're walking down the street by yourself at night and hear a noise behind you, you will have a different emotional response based on whether it's the sound of a cat or the sound of footsteps. Our thoughts help determine how strong our emotional response will be. The physiological aspect involves active changes in the body physically. For example, an increased heart rate when you are scared or sweating when you are nervous. The expressive behavioral component involves the various forms of expressions that emotions may take. So for example, facial expressions, bodily gestures, postures, and tone of voice, which changes with the emotion being expressed, like anger, joy, fear, or sorrow. Your body posture probably looks a lot different from when you're happy than from when you're sad. The instrumental behaviors are any behaviors or actions that are done to satisfy a motive. Everyone experiences and engages in instrumental behaviors every single day. For example, going to class every day is an instrumental behavior for someone who is motivated to get a good grade in their class. Preparing food is the instrumental behavior of someone who plans on eating. So thoughts influence emotions and emotions influence behavior. And if you can control your thoughts and emotions, it will be easier to control your behavior. Okay, to sum up, motivation is the why we do what we do, and emotion is why we feel the way we do. That's it until next week.